Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. Beautiful. Just like this whole show. That's, uh, what note was that? Are you that good of a... No, but okay. re- remember that sitcom um, Parks and Rec? Yes. They had a character who sang his lines sometimes. No matter was, what. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I'm we have a whole that. we have an whole, whole hour for you to uh, chant. We could do that. We could chant an entire episode. My chant game is not strong. I And I also think the chant game is not wanted, at least in <laughs> uh, radio realm. So we'll, we'll, we won't do that. What we will say is this is the uncommon good, and we are happy to be here with you. I'm Bo Bonner, senior advisor over at Mercy College of Health Sciences. Bud? I am also at Mercy College of Health Sciences. I am the dean of liberal arts and sciences. So if you love the liberal arts, I'm here for you. And we've been at this thing here on Iowa Catholic Radio here in the middle of the country for eight years, right? Yeah. And we right. have, yeah. And I mean, because it's going to be eight years, I think, in September. So it's very close to eight years. But um, I got here eight years ago in January. And within a half month, we had tricked the good people of Iowa to let us be on the airwaves. Yeah. You know, this eight year anniversary, there's it's something kind of like sad for me because I, I distinctly remember. So if, if you're about my age, you know, when you get into your mid to late forties, like how your mind starts to change just like the rest of your body. Um, wow. That's a lot packed into that statement. Yeah. I, that could be an episode on its own, <laughs> but I, so those early episodes are, they're kind of a blur for me. I remember touching on like, um, pillars of Catholic social teaching. Yes. But I do recall eight years ago in September discussing like the Cardinals, like in their playoff position. Uh, I don't think we'll be doing that this summer. We- we, we will <laughs> definitely not. 2016, yeah, Hope was still alive back then. It was a then. good team. They, but, they weren't gangbusters, but they were they were solid. I mean, not to uh, wax too much about yesteryear, uh, I understand why we moved from uh, the diocese. We, we used to be downtown at the diocese, and uh, there's all sorts of reasons. I mean, I can't believe how we had all of that equipment yeah. uh, just shoved into the place that we did. And it's one of those deals that you sort of imagine uh, that it was much more cozier. But if you went back, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we'd all fit in there. But I do remember thinking that was the first time I'd ever done anything where, you know, I was producing stuff and at the time live yeah. uh, when we were helping out with stuff. And because it was like the street was outside, I, I kind of felt like it was like we're in Rockefeller Center, but the Des Moines version. It did feel like that. That's what I was going to comment. And the traffic would be whizzing by. And like, I think we had a webcam. I always wanted to have the, you know, like the breaking news music that you hear on, on the news. Like, yes. dun, 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 dun. And, you know, we'd give a traffic report like, uh, like things look congested outside. They would give the traffic report for one of our commercial breaks back then. Because I remember that they kept saying Mix Master. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was funny because they're talking about uh, whatever the exchange between 235 and I-80. But I thought yeah. we were about to break it down with some mad raps uh with the mix master but one thing i can say uh that we can still break it down to every time is we want to break it down and say thank you to mercy college of health sciences for underwriting our show something that has been going on all eight years mchs.edu and but just to think about eight years of the show but to think eight years of mercy college students um extending that healing mer- uh, ministry that they got from the Sisters of Mercy. Um, we're, of course, right on the precipice of starting a fall semester, mm-hmm. but people are always able to go look for, uh, you know, spring, summer, and then the next fall. We're always accepting new students, mchs.edu. Yeah, fall semester is always our busiest. So on today's show, I'm going to try to take a deep breath mm. and relax because I know just around the corner. Well, it's a good, it's a good it problem. I thought you were wheezing, but you were taking a deep breath. Yeah. No, I'm just- <laughs> The asthma's <laughs> kicking into no. Uh, I know. Just in just a couple of days, we'll be um, welcoming. Like the the halls are going to be full yes. and bustling. Well, and I mean, I know that you are all probably listening to football. The first, you know, we had week zero, but yeah. this is firmly week one. Not going to comment on any of the games. We're going to let those play out so that you don't have to hear. You know how how it turned out for all of us. I'm sure by next week <laughs> we'll make banter about it. But football's back. Mercy College of Health Science falls back. We're back, 
and we want you to come back after these messages. This is the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. So wonderful to have you with us, whether you're listening on the Iowa Catholic Radio Airwaves Network, the Iowa Catholic Radio app, iowacatholicradio.com, and of course, our wonderful, beautiful, proud, regal podcast listeners. Thank you for being a part of our show. Bud, um, we like to do this every so often where one of us has an idea and we try to, maybe ambush is too hard of a word, but surprise uh, the other one to get their ideas on stuff. So I'm throwing it over you to start the ambush. Well, in the intro to the show today, I mentioned when we first started the show, we did kind of the pillars of Catholic social teaching. So we talked about subsidiarity, solidarity. There's a whole list. A a litany. Yep. This kind of gets at that. So I want to go back to kind of like first principles, first things. I want to talk today about the church. Mm. And I've heard of that. I've heard of the, the church. <laughs> and and this church you speak of. The theology world, the technical term we use is ecclesiology. And if you're a listener listening, maybe for the first time or relatively new, you might be asking yourself, what does the church have to do with Catholic social teaching? Well, I say a lot. It's at the center of it. Um, kind of as a foil, as like sort of a negative example we both know a writer. I think you were friends with him at a time in the past. I won't mention his name. Cause yeah, sorry. sorry. No. Such a great way to put it. <laughs> well, I mean, I should say you've hung out with him. That's right. That's right. He, he kind of writes as if Catholic social teaching is optional. So he says like what the church provides for us is the creed and doctrine and belief. So you go to your uh, Denzinger or your catechism, and that's where you really find the meat of the Catholic faith. But the church has, has, has spoken about and written about social issues. And for him, like he kind of acts like, well, that's not, that's not infallible and we can kind of discard it and see where it's wrong, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a really thin way to approach the gift that the church has given us with Catholic social teaching. Now he has a point. There are different sort of like levels of authority. That's not the, the topic for today's show. And so like, there is a sense where when Pius the Twelfth pronounced dogmatically about the the doctrine of the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven, which we recently celebrated, that has this kind of like firmness, like this solidity, where as a Catholic you you can't question that, you know, and be in good standing. Catholic social teaching there is sometimes prudential judgments. You could talk about the relative weight of different documents, but it's 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 important business, and I think the Church has given us a gift, and part of how we live that out. So if we start talking this morning about or today about practical nuts and bolts is uh, the church is a polis. It's a, it's a society. It has a shape and a form that persists across time. For myself, because of like my own spiritual journey, I have a real gratitude for this because I grew up in churches where the understanding of the church was that it was just like a congregation. So it was people who came together once a week and what unified them is they said, we all want to believe and follow what's taught in the Bible. The Catholic church, of course, is a much more like, rambling large. I mean, it's like we've, we've stuffed this huge global family into this vehicle and we're, we're barreling down the highway, so to speak. <laughs> but there are things sometimes that are frustrating for us. So we've talked on the show sometimes about like, man, you see scandal in the church, you see decisions made by different bishops, et cetera. And it's, it's frustrating. We would probably do things differently. But what I want to start with Bo this morning is those things that can be frustrating are also real gifts. Because if you boil down the church simply to like one congregation where it's a gathering of like-minded persons. That's not negligible, but I think that's a far cry from what Christ ordained. And so things like the papacy, um, the communion of the saints, the extension of the church across the globe and across time, that's what God intended. And it's, it really does have to do with Catholic social teaching. What I mean by that is our, our first witness, or I would say like our primary witness to the work that God is doing in the world is through that vehicle. Thoughts? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, back to you. No. so I think it's interesting to throw out the church and its reality socially as something that needs to be established so that we can talk about Catholic social teaching. Because as you point out, too often Catholic social teaching gets flattened. I know I use that word a lot, but it really does get flattened into sort of um, an amalgamation of policies that happen to be ha- uh espoused at one time. And so this is clearly the part of the church where you can get into arguments and make it sound like 
oh, the church has always taught this, and it's only been recently that it's changed its mind about that. So people will do that to see, just say the church is not as firm of standing as you say it is, or people will get really choosy, you know, like, I liked the church in 1350, and that's what I'm rolling with. Hmm. And it's absolutely the case that as the church goes through time, it should be making policy, prudential decisions based as much as possible on first principles. And like, as you said, on dogmatic foundations as much as possible, but that's just not going to be a constant reality. So for instance, let's just make it not about like the Bishop of Rome, talk about any Bishop in an American diocese has to make a choice about how you would support what's going on in your local house of Congress, for instance. Mm -hmm. And That definitely is magisterium, right? It's a teaching of a bishop trying to apply the infallible reality, the dogmatic reality of the church, the principles of social teaching, but then trying to imagine, in this case, what's the best way to do that? There will be better or worse than all of that, etc. But to your point, if the church is not a reality that, so to speak, exists as the liminal space between the saints in heaven and us sinners on the ground— then we will simply be rising and falling on that wave or the tide, of it were, mm-hmm. of the times. I think one thing that I appreciate that Pope Francis constantly points out, although sometimes maybe we don't, maybe we have different ideas about what prompts us to say it. The world, uh, the church in the world, very much is affected and infected by worldliness, and worldliness i think suffers under at least in english a bad um a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth that it because you know to be honest other people than catholics use it and can sound very puritanical or can sound otherworldly or gnostic or things like this it can seem very bound up in an individual uh, individualistic piety and asking about what that looks like but worldliness is to say that we sort of attach our hopes and our, what, we're, what we're aiming for, even in terms of things of the church, in a very worldly way. And this, to me, is, goes back to something I'm always worried about, that we use the church or religion or God or the faith in a utilitarian way, that we have an end that we want to get to, and so we're going to use the holy things of, this war, uh, of, of Christ uh, to get what we want. And when it doesn't do that, of course, we'll either be disappointed or we'll act like we have to do some other strategy. But the brute fact of the church, maybe this is what you're getting at, but if there is not the brute fact of the Ecclesia Dei, of the the church of God, if there's not the brute fact of the kingdom of Christ that he speaks to, um, we will get carried away in the waves of worldliness, even us that maybe think of ourselves as the most attuned to that worry or most concerned about it or the people who really are trying to affect... um, the principles that we're we're taught by the church in the world, if we are not constantly reminded that the anchor that is the reality of the church predetermines anything we might do in and of the world as we proceed. Is that sort of what you're getting at? It is. And in Catholic circles, a popular term for the church is the mystical body of Christ. And when we, when we talk about the church, the, the fact that it's a body is really important. And we can get into that later in the show. Um, if we're an alternative society, the church can't be made up of like, so in some Protestant understandings, the church is like all true believers throughout the world. And so there's kind of this idea like denominations can believe and teach different things, but there's sort of these core issues that everybody signs on to. If the church is going to be like an alternative society that witnesses to the kingdom of God, it has to be a body. Mm -hmm. But I think the first part of that term is really important too. It's mystical. And there's a lot you could say about that, Bo, but I think one important piece of it is it's not a voluntary society. Mm. So most, most of the societies that we are a part of today, we sort of opt into, or at least we believe that we do. Even being an American and like a citizen of this country, there's sort of this idea of the social contract. Like I sign on and agree to these terms. The church, God's grace precedes us, right? And I was at a baptism this weekend. It's really moving to see a child be made a member of the family of God before that individual is able to sort of like make that choice for themselves on like someone's faith sort of stands in for, for theirs. Now, as we get older and we reach the age of reason, et cetera, there are obligations that are put upon us and we can 
in a sense, like rupture our relationship with the church where we're still Catholic, but you know, we've, we've broken off because of the path that we've taken. I always go like ahead. this when people go like, Oh, you can't do that. You can't like have someone become part of the church by baptizing with their babies. By the way, here's the baby social security card, <laughs> right? Like we, yeah. you know, a nation founded on the idea of social contract is like, by the way, if you're born here to American parents, we, 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 we already have you slated to pay taxes someday. So it's funny what, how that will sort of get, um, thrown around. Sorry to interrupt. See, but I, yeah. And I think this is really important because when we get our social security card, like as we get older, we find out that there are obligations that are put upon us that we didn't sign up for. Yeah. Like you're not supposed to laminate it, but I think my parents did. <laughs> I, sorry, federal government, if you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that part out. No. So it, it places obligations upon us. And I'm going to steal this from Will Cavanaugh, who's a friend of the show. Great writer. His new book is amazing, by the way, just shout out mm -hmm. divine treasures. We need to get that on the shelves. But he says, we sometimes operate with this assumption that the church places a claim on our soul, mm -hmm. the government or our country places a claim on our body. So it can kind of tell you like what you do with your body. For instance, like getting drafted mm -hmm. into the military, we have no, no choice. My body now has to like, uh, de not deport. What's it called when we send soldiers out? Deploy. De deploy. Yeah. Deployed to wherever. Right. Mm -hmm. What Kavanaugh says, and he has a really interesting discussion of like the city of God in relationship to the city of man, but he says both societies try to claim all of us. Mm -hmm. And if we operate with the assumption that the church just has a claim on our soul, our discipleship is going to be stunted. It's not going to reach the full potential of what Christ has called us to. And I think there's really good reasons when you go back to the gospels to affirm what Kavanaugh's saying, because Jesus and you know, I have to give this qualification because there are really important writers like Adolf von Harnack, who says like Christ, basically he taught the brotherhood of man. And so it's sort of like following Christ becomes this kind of impulse or ethos that you adopt. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like liberal values writ large. Whereas Jesus, when you get into his actual ethical teaching and he gives it first and foremost to his apostles and the community that he intended to persist after his resurrection and ascension. It's all the nuts and bolts of life. I mean, it's, it gets down to how you use your money. Um, it has to do with marriage and family. I would say, I mean, explicitly marriage, Jesus doesn't un unpack a ton of like family life, but, um, the, the ethics is embracing of all of life and it claims both body and soul. So I agree completely with what you're saying. There's a book I've been reading that seems like it would have nothing to do with this, but I'm going to bring it into it. So the book is called The House of Government. It's by Yuri Slez Slezkine. I'm, I'm messing up his last name. S-L-E-Z-K-I-N-E. -E. And it's actually about the first group of functionaries and bureaucrats after the Soviet Revolution in 1917. And it's talking about why all of these people in Russia were sort of prepped and ready to go in order to become these functionaries. The House of Government, bud, it was literally a house where a lot of the government officials lived. Um, so the state sort of set up a place for them, this big dormitory for them to live. Um, but he's also referring it to like, you know, the House of Lords or like the House of Bonner, the House of Mars, so the House of Government, right? It, and he tells it sort of like a story about a family throughout time. He has this whole section on millennialism because he goes, the reason so many people in Russia were sort of prone and primed to join the revolution is because millennialism was running rampant in Russia ever since really the old believer crisis. So this is like a long Russian history, but let us just say that the late 1800s into the early 1900s, religious fervor for sort of like a, an insanely violent apocalypse was just in the air. And so to create a sort of material apocalypse, right? So there's no spirituality, but they sort of vacate all of that millennialism to Bolshevikism and, and the revolution, right? You know, trying to make the rivers run with blood, but not at the behest of angels, but at the behest of the people who were doing this. So anyway, this is the argument of his book. Hmm. But he has this whole point where he goes, look, Christianity is this very weird animal, um, even compared to, so like certainly compared to the sort of pagan um, understandings of what religion and, and the state does, right? Um, the sort of cycles that sort of uh, give the foundation for why, you know, there should be a thousand year rule of, of this or that emperor. Even within sort of Judaism, right, who always sort of has this 
you were once slaves, you were coming out of Egypt, there was always a Babylon to resist, or even Islam, where you have Muhammad, he's a millennialist too, but because he had to sort of like rule, right? He, he lived a lot of his life as a ruler. Islam has a sort of foundation about this idea of like, yeah, so like we'll make a caliphate. Jesus's life, and of course this guy, he's not Christian, so he's saying, well, Jesus was sort of a millennialist uh, prophet, sort of. He talks about an imminence, right, of things happening, but also an already and not yet. And I'll be honest, in the book, he kind of says that this is a sort of unclear, un, un, you know, a, a moment of not being clear in Christianity, and that's why you see Christian um, regimes go different ways, because politics, so to speak, is always a bad fit for Christianity. I, of course, think this is a great description and a feature, not a bug, right? That politics never fits well on this ecclesial body. But I will say this, that one of the heresies that continues to happen is this immunitizing of millennialism, which is a big dorky way to say people get impatient of waiting for Christ to come back. Hmm. So they start making the millennium come back on their own. And one of the weird ways this works out, bud, is two very different things in the United States history is on one hand, you get sort of like Calvinists who believe that they have been, you know, double predestined, but that sort of means that what you have left on earth is to sort of act to see if you're one of the predestined or not. And then the sort of Aryan, not like the ancient heresy, but the more modern one where like you have to sort of prove it, right? Like you have to bring the, the millennium, if, if not to bear on civic life, at least on your own soul. And so exactly like you were saying, this is what really caught me, the, my attention there is you go, the fact that we baptize babies shows that we believe grace is a different order of thing, that it's partly about human will, right? Like the, the parents of the baby chose to do that, right? But on the other hand, it's not completely of the will, right? But it's also not just purely natural. So it's not just blood and soil. You came from this part of land, so you're going to have this, you know, these pagan gods and these gods of your ancestors and these gods of the hills. It's both already and not yet, right? It's because of this anticipation, your parents chose to baptize you, but you were by grace given into that world where you were baptized. And converts is the same way, right? You ran into the people that helped you convert, etc. So the church being not just the sort of natural temple of the place you were from, nor just the society of the chosen, but this thing that exists in between. It is the fulfillment, right? Already, it's the, every church is the victory to come already here and now, but made up of sinners who have not yet been conformed to that eternity. And that's tricky and I think but the, what we're getting at with ecclesiology and why the church is important with Catholic social teaching is if you fall into either, right, either of those temptations, the church is just the ethnic thing my ethnic group does, and Lord knows tons of that happened in the United States, much less Europe, or if it becomes the church is the society of the chosen, like we signed that social contract, not only will you, of course, mess up your salvation, most important of all, but certainly you will mess up how the faith interacts with the rest of the polis, with politics, with human life here and now. Yeah, and all of this kind of flips on its head sometimes the way that we think about being a member of the church. So I mentioned oblig obligations, and you sort of hinted at the way we can even turn something as important as the church into sort of like this utilitarian kind of like pragmatic tool that we can use when really... As, as members who have been incorporated into the mystical body of Christ, the question for us is like, what obligations do we owe God? What's due God? And first and foremost, worship, but also like uh, the sacrifice of our, like um, what's uh, in Romans, I believe it's chapter 12, where he talks about making his very self a sacrifice, right? So Paul talks about, St. Paul talks about like the, the work of salvation that God's affecting or bringing about throughout history and says, therefore I, I offer myself as a living sacrifice that takes place, like we make that commitment sort of individually, but we're drawn into this community. And all of a sudden, I know we're up against a break here. It kind of like, um, it kind of transforms the way we think about being a member of the church because there is a way you can practice religion and 
the, like in contemporary parlance as a sort of like, well, my nine to five Monday through Friday is most important during the week. And I, I try to wind down. And as part of that, like I like going to mass because it's, right. it's peaceful right. and I can sort of like recharge my yeah. battery. Right. Yep, yep. But in the second segment of the show, we want to get to thinking about like how we move beyond that and start to live out the discipleship that Christ has called us to as a way of witness to the world. All right. Will you guys recharge your batteries on these commercials and we'll be back right after this. <laughs> Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. We're going to keep it rolling from what we were talking about in the first segment. So talking about ecclesiology, the church as a brute fact of reality and what that does, as it were, to how we understand Catholic social teaching, politics, how we exist in the world. But I, I, I'm going to maybe summarize or, or sort of go in a different direction, but I, it's, it, it's, I'm responding to exactly what you left off in the last segment. One of the things I guess I'm trying to get at is if the church is this already and not yet, mm-hmm. already and not yet, and we honestly do this too often in the church, it's like a get out of uh, jail free card. Like when someone has a hard question, we're like, ah, both and, already not yet, right? It can sound like we're trying to uh, confuse the issue. I actually think it is a much stronger statement being made that because God and Christ, God is eternal and Christ's victory is eternal, there's this question about how that works out in time. And so it really can look like everything Jesus is saying is about time running out. And when it runs out and like the scroll is done, uh, this paradise happens. And so you can really ask yourself, shouldn't we at all costs be making time leap forward as much as possible? And it's not only the case like how some people, if that is your read of Jesus, right? And I mean, let's be honest, you can certainly read Jesus and the apostles as this is all happening extremely soon. There's no reason to do anything, right? Because it's all about to happen. You can start to see like, well, then Jesus's reign was disappointed, right? Because it didn't happen like, you know, right after he was resurrected. And what about Paul and all them who acted like, you know, it would, it would probably happen before they died, but here they all died. And so people will throw out this, oh, this is the narrative. Christianity thought, you know, that it was this millennial cult. It didn't work out. And so then they sort of uh, made good with the empire. And now we have this institution. Certainly one read, certainly one temptation that I think churches throughout time have fallen prey to. But I think this gr- greatly misunderstands the sort of Jesus is, talking about the end of time and that time is running out, but he also keeps talking about that eternity is already here if you die to yourself and are reborn. There's all sorts of things like, for instance, I think when he was talking about the great conflagration, I mean, the temple is destroyed, Jerusalem is sacked by Rome, all within a hundred years of everything that was happening in the Bible. I think people overdo it with this sort of, they had prophecies that weren't fulfilled. But I'll say this, if you think that sort of eternity keeps cutting into time, I don't think you need to speed time up as much as some people think. I think when you get a sort of millennialist, we have to become accelerationist, right? We got to make the end of time and have it happen now. These people keep forgetting that time is already, so to speak, done and consummated in eternity. So it's not like God is prevented from already giving us the victory it's that so to speak we're not prepared to accept the victory in its fullness because we're still here in time Mm -hmm. but that's why the church the church as that gate of heaven has to be foremost in any sort of catholic social teaching that we have we already think eternity shines into the fabric of time so we don't have to be accelerationists But on the other hand, we don't think that time is just one dang thing after another happening in endless circles. We also think time can redeem individuals, groups, nations, etc. That both and, that already not yet, to me, is a very pregnant one. Not one that we use to evade difficult questions, but as I said, I think it's a feature and not a bug of the church. Yeah, and that's... So what's fascinating to me about Christianity, the history of Christianity is in 33 AD, the Messiah, like the one who 
the disciples thought was the Messiah was crucified. And shortly thereafter, they start going throughout the countryside proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord or Kyrios. Political shots fired, right? Ew. In a normal set of circumstances, if your leader had been executed by the government, <laughs> you normally back off that sort of thing. Yeah. Like, well, this guy had some interesting teachings. Uh, you know, we thought this was going to happen and it didn't. But all of a sudden, they start saying Jesus Christ is Lord. And that language is charged in that context. So part of the question for me, Bo, is how do we live into the reality that of the kingship of Christ? Like we talk about that on the show all the time, right? And that's where you get into, you start having interesting discussions about like sort of, you could say like, what is the telos or the end of the church? And this is where it gets nuanced. I don't think there's not an answer, but there's a lot of debate about the right answer. So what, like you could say the purpose of the church is to transform society. And, and Jesus was up front. Like, I, I think this is a thread throughout the new Ter- Testament. The world is not as it's supposed to be. So with what Catholics, Catholics call original sin, it affects us not only on an individual level, like my life has been affected by original sin, right. but St. Paul says all of creation groans for the revelation of the children of God. And so the salvation that God eventually brings about into its fullness is going to involve the restoration of all things. I think that's the restoration of all things is different than simply like tweaking society. Right. Right. And yet Jesus teachings, you know, what he called his disciples to that was seen as radical. And I think that's part of the reason the Romans wanted to kill him. But the temptation constantly, I think for the church across time is to say like, so the social order is what it is. We see these faults and we're going to try to like sort of uh we're going to turn a few knobs, oil a few joints, <laughs> right, right? Right, right, right. Um, you know, I, I a little phrase that I love, which I think is just like packed with a lot of significance and you could really spend a lot of time with it. When we were at Duke, uh, Stanley Harawas, who taught us ethics, he said the first task of the church is to show the world that it's the world. Mm. So it's not like it's not like you start with this kind of outcome in mind. Like, uh, well, we, we all see problems with society. The world is not as it's supposed to be. How do we use the levers to get to point B, right? The first task of the church is to show the world that it's the world. And we do that by witnessing to a different way of life. Yeah. So I, this makes me have the question, was it the baptism that you attended that made you think uh, to ask this question? Because if it's so, I actually think baptism is that sort of witness starts to be an interesting way to conceive of these things. It was, I mean, I think this summer it's been on my mind a lot. Like whenever we roll up to, a national election. Mm-hmm. It's, it's interesting to, to see like how Christians navigate those waters and huh, pun intended. What part of it? Baptism. Oh, baptism waters. and waters. Yeah. What, what are you thinking with baptism? Oh no, I just was saying p- pun, but like, so I mean, I'm with you that if you want to talk about a very political act mm. is if baptism is a political act and we mean this in the way that to baptize a child or to be an adult convert and be baptized is to be baptized into a death and resurrection, right? In a political event. To be baptized is to join an execution that an empire decided to do on someone they deemed rebellious enough to kill. So already, right, a political act to be baptized, but to be baptized is a political witness that there is a body that supervenes the power of a very powerful nation that we all live in right now. But we say baptism says we belong to a body more important than the most powerful nation on earth. That is in a, in a yeah. year of a, of a, of a, of an election, an extremely political act. Yeah. When I've talked about baptism in classes, like when I've taught at, I had the privilege to teach at Duquesne or St. Louis university here at the catechetical Institute in Des Moines. I've, I've, I've tried to point out. Um, and again, whenever you talk about these things, you don't want to appear like, you've got like the secret code or that, you know, like (laughs) you've walked the path perfectly, but I have on occasion seen baptisms and churches where it took on kind of a sentimental key. And so like the, uh, the minister of baptism sort of prays the baby around and like as human beings, we naturally ooh and all like it's an amazing thing. And that impulse isn't wrongheaded, but there's something really radical and profound and moving about baptism that has to do with the fact that the child is, exercised E X O R C I Z E D. So called out of, you know, the land of darkness, you could say, um, 
you know, like we, 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 we cast out demons. There's no other way to like capture it and called into the body of Christ, but then marked with the sign of the cross. Mm-hmm. I think when you think about typologies, when I watch a baptism, my mind goes to the binding of Isaac mm-hmm. where, uh, so God has called Abraham to be the father of a great nation, a society or like a, 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 a body, a politic, right? And part of that becoming of a great nation is through his lineage. So he gives Abraham his one and only son and says, Oh, by the way, I want you to go to this mountain and sacrifice him. And the commentary both in scripture and then later like post biblical era is just fascinating about why that command, what's going on there. But I personally love um, the treatment in the book of Hebrews where it says Abraham was willing to give God his only son because he believed that God could bring him back from the very dead. And what a powerful picture of baptism that, like you said, we bring our children to this font in a way they're, they're buried in the waters. They, they die to self. They're marked with the sign of the cross. And then all of a sudden, or like for the rest of their lives, that claim that God has put upon them becomes preeminent. And it's a, it's a claim that has precedence over all other claims. And if you're living in life right now in our society and you don't feel like the pull of other claims upon your life, like we probably don't have our eyes open, right? Cause it's not only our government that places claims upon our life, but it's also our economy, um, the marketing that goes with it, that does it in much more subtle fashion, but usually in a deeper way, even than like uh, the other sort of like societies that we're a part of. Yeah, I uh, I was asked to <laughs> do baptismal prep for new parents oh, wow. at one point in my life, and I was taken off that one because I made all the new parents read the Binding of Isaac, <laughs> and I said, look, you actually do give up your child. Just lucky for you, the church hands it back every time. Mm. People were like, you're, you're technically right. Maybe you can be <laughs> more gentle. Maybe you should do that. Maybe you can only talk to people who've had like five kids, right? Um, but to me, why this is important is if you read Exodus, I mean, excuse me, Genesis, and like you said, Hebrew in the commentary, what people seem to forget is not that, oh, God asked Moses to give Isaac up and then stopped him before he did. No, even in the 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 Hebrew of of the Genesis, it says, "Because you have not withheld your son, so much so that there's some people that go, oh, I'm sure in a prior one, actually, it's written that Isaac was sacrificed, and then they changed it. I don't think that's true. They're just pointing about how much afterwards, even that angel says, because you did not withhold your son. So you don't withhold your child in baptism. You give your kid away, knowing you'll get it back. And in so many ways, that is the truth of the Christian faith in general, to give your life away with the firm hope and belief that God will give it back because he promised he would. That's what faith is, to have faith in that promise, that if you give your life away, you will give it back, you'll get it back a hundred, a thousand fold. So we give our children to the church to get the, the child handed back to us. But, but then this further thing to point out about this already, not yet, it's not like you get the kid back and it's glowing or you're like, oh, this kid literally has a body that can't be injured now. In some ways, right, it's just as poignant because you know this kid will die like you will die in the body. But now it says it were there is an entirely different stratosphere in which life and death also plays out. That if that child, as the liturgy goes, hands back the baptismal garment unstained at the, t- the day of judgment, you know, of course, like the grace of God and confession, all these things like this, but that they will never die, right? And that the bodies that we will inherit at, at the resurrection will not be capable of decomposition and death. And so that sort of radicality of the both and the already not yet, already housed in baptism to say we are in the world, but not of the world. We live as if we are strangers here. All of that wrapped up in baptism, well, I am going to put you a bit on the spot right now, and I'm not, I'm not going to have you, ask you a tough question, but I think with the show, there's sort of a certain cadence, and it's like you, you know what's coming up, and then it's easier to recall what we're supposed to perform. <laughs> say, you know, at the end of the show, you end the show with, may Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Could you say that real quickly? Uh, reign in our hearts, our family, our city, our state, our nation, the world, the solar system galaxy, the whole kitten caboodle. By... By that time of the show, maybe some listeners or their eyes are starting to glaze over. You know, like it's 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 rote. I mean, we we hear it each week, but I think there's a ton packed in there as well. And you really you could use it as like 
Like that's something you could write on a sticky note and put on your mirror as sort of like a compass for life. Because when you say the reign of Christ starts in our hearts. So the first question that I have to ask is like, am I aligned with the will of God? And our families, you and I as fathers, like when we talk about our own like sphere of authority, um, it doesn't always work out super well, but like the God has given us children. Um, that's, that's a huge part of our vocation, our sanctification. And so like when we start thinking about the reign of God, hopefully in our hearts, we're thinking about what that calls us to there. And then our families, we start getting into like our parishes and our communities. And I feel like with each concentric circle, there's less that you can control. Yeah. Like with my children, I can control so much at work. It gets dicier sometimes. But we start getting to like parish and city. It's really tough because there's a lot of people walking around. They're like, okay, you think that. But the, the amazing thing about the gospel, though, and I know this is something we've had on the show before. So we're called to be faithful with what God has given to us. And we get to the level of like city and country. We're still called to be faithful. Like you, you, you come up against resistance and the idea is not like, well... Jesus said this, it applies to my family and my church, but I can't really help the city, right? Pray for the city that God has sent you to. If you preach the gospel and if you live it out and all that the polis knows what to do with you is to persecute you, throw you in prison, perhaps execute you, that is a form of witness itself. And that's, you know, for me, that's kind of disorienting to think about and sometimes difficult to consider for myself or for my children. But when the Roman government crucified Christ, Satan thought that was the last word. Like he had shut the door, right? Mm -hmm. And that was actually the seed that flowered out into this amazing story that God's bringing about. And so when we're called to faithfulness, that might not work out with, uh, you know, a padded 401k or a city that's uh, that, that builds a statue of St. Louis outside of city hall or whatever. But if we are faithful with what we've been given, and if we preach when God has called us to preach, and when we turn the other cheek, when God has called us to turn the other cheek, I, when we reach um, the gates of heaven, I think um, Christ will, I know Christ will say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, I think one practical thing that this has absolute real implications for politics, but it would have to start locally and then work up to state and federal level. Christians need to stop being an easy date for politicians. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is too often different denominations, different types of Christians are considered sure bets for one party or the other. But if you can imagine that like the best thing that we might be able to do as Christians is if we at least caused politicians fits trying to get our vote. Like we should play coy in politics. <laughs> it should be the idea in a, as a politician that you go, you know, I know I can get this group and this group and this group behind me, but then there's those Christians, right? And they're so hard to convince to join, you know, on our train, right? Like to, to vote for us, to, to be, um, you know, a, a sure bet come election day. If we could just make them lose sleep thinking about their policies or their platforms and how they're going to fit such strange puzzle pieces as the Christians into their coalition, that might be the best thing we can do. And I think the problem, bud, is that used to happen in all sorts of ways. I'll admit in America it had a lot to do with sort of like ethnic ties of the church. I'm not yeah. going to deny that. But still, as imperfect as it was, locally, it really mattered if the Irish bishop of some of the eastern states thought you were the bee's knees or not as a politician. And again, tied in with all sorts of stuff that is certainly not Christian, but man, that's something, right? That yeah. the politicians had to squirm to think, will the Christians be on my side? As we sort of va evacuate the importance of local and then state, and so now everything seems to be about the federal government or nothing, we become a cheap date, right? It becomes easy to think the Christians, these type of Christians will vote X, these will vote Y. And it's, it's frustrating and a little bit despairing to think that um, if I told a politician, well, I'm not going to vote for any of you because none of you stand for the church, that people would dismiss us and go, ah, well, that's you. Um, you know, you're, you're too good. You're too pure for politics. No, I think that w it, what we can hope to attain in this life as Christians is for entire pol parties to go, man, we have to figure out how to get the Christians on board with us, and it's going to be difficult. That I think we could practically and re realistically shoot for. There's this story that I really love. You know, Father Richard John Newhouse, who founded First Things Magazine and then right. was the longtime editor. Rusty Reno, who taught at Creighton for a time, he tells a story about like after 
a certain presidential election, he was really like distraught and depressed because he thought like, oh, this new president is bad for the country. And he went to the Richard John Newhouse, Father Newhouse, and he was kind of unloading about this. And Father Newhouse said he wrote a lot about politics and society. He had a lot of strong opinions, but he stopped Rusty and said, you know, like he, he said, the, Repu- the, Repu- the Republican Party is going to betray us too, right? And this kind of like took Rusty back. Now, again, you could say more about that story, but like it kind of gets to the point that you're you're getting at if our trust is in princes, eventually they're not, they're not firm and steadfast like God, right? So we can trust the word of God. And I hope on today's show, what we've sort of like cast a vision for is following Christ is not quietism. It's not just like, oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket and I'm going to bunker down and wait for the end, right? It's also not just sort of like grabbing the reins of power and trying to craft a society that like looks right in our own mind. It's a, uh, it's much more interesting, but I think challenging than that. And uh, this could probably be the start of a series because there's more to say. And I know we're, we're getting near the end of the show. Maybe it's something to do for the eight year anniversary. This is the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner, Dr. Bud Mars. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Back with the Uncommon Good, Bob Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. But it's always nice when we're wrapping up. On one hand, you feel like we hit a good resting place. But on the other hand, you're like, okay, and we can keep talking about this. Yeah. And uh, sort of in the process of doing a show, thinking about what we might do with some coming up. Uh, I think it might be time. I mean, you know, you could wait for 10 years, but why not with eight years and with it being an election year and everything like that? We can revisit some of those first shows you talked about that we got to do eight years ago and uh, reconsider those basics of um, Catholic social teaching. But as you said, and I think we did this the right way, to talk about the church first as not the principle, but the firm foundation that any other principles could be built. I think it's a heck of a way to start out considering these things once more. Well, and a huge part of the church's life, of course, is the life of prayer. Um, that's the, the aura, the work that we've been called to, right? If you want to join us in our prayer life, please do so weekly, daily. We pray the rosary on air at 6 and 10 a.m. And then later in the afternoon, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy at 2.55 p.m. But you can also use the Iowa Catholic Radio app to pray the rosary anytime, anywhere. And if you want to make sure to keep up on what's going on in and around the Diocese of Des Moines and, of course, the whole Iowa Catholic Radio listening area, you can go to iowacatholicradio.com and go to events. Um, On September 1st, for instance, Iowa Catholic Radio Family Celebration out in West Des Moines. Uh, September 6th, Iowa Catholic Radio First Friday Mass. September 13th, the Man Up West Power Lunch. And then, of course, September 28th through 29th, the Christ Our Life Conference. And then the fall fundraiser are going to be starting October 1st through 4th. You can ke- ah, check out the details, excuse me. You can check out the details on iowacatholicradio.com on the events page. Furthermore, this ministry does not happen without you. This ministry, it is a ministry, first of all. Um, I, it's, it's a ministry that I know Bud and I are happy to be a part of, all the lo- local radio hosts, all the national ones. But it happens because of you. It's not just us behind the mics, the people behind the boards, the people behind the desks. It is your ministry as well. You make it possible through your time, talent, and treasure. We appreciate everyone who prays for us. We appreciate everyone who volunteers and puts in that work and time uh, to make this happen. But we very much also need your donations. Without your donations, without the material means to support this ministry, we would not be able to do what we do. We thank you for all those people who give regularly. Like I said, coming up in October, we're going to have... Um, the fall uh, donation spectacular, but that doesn't mean you can't start now getting those plans ready. You can call 515-223-1150, 515-223-1150 to call or text in order to get those donations going, or you can go to iowacatholicradio.com and click on the donation button. We appreciate everyone who is there for us. We couldn't make this work without you. Thank you so much for what you're doing, but please prayerfully start to consider what you might be willing to donate to Iowa Catholic Radio to keep up this good work. Bud, I want to declare yes. a success, success. Uh, your question. So I, I, I do think that um, providentially we were waiting uh, to plant that seed so we could get um, another, I don't know if we want to call it a series yet. We'll see how it goes. But another sort of um, direction 
and trail that we're going to blaze by yeah. coming back and reconsidering those first shows and getting at the principles. Nice. So good idea. Did you, you have the baptism to think? So thank, thankfully you got to go to that baptism over the yeah. weekend. If you're listening, there's you know, there's probably some games going on. We, we won't mention anything, but I hope your games go well. This is the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr, we will be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.